So this is being, uh, the audio of this presentation is being recorded, and then we'll go back later on and put in the right stuff. Yeah, so all right, okay. Uh, so um, this is a workshop. By the way, welcome everyone, uh, jumping in too quickly. Um, my name is Anthony Marini, and I'm the uh, Senior Teaching Associate here at EDC. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this presentation is that I spend most of my life both inside and outside the university dealing with issues of assessment. And part of assessment is this uh, formal piece, grading. And some of you who've uh, been in my courses before know that I think of assessment as the broad umbrella that captures a lot of things. And under that umbrella is this evaluative piece, which is grading, and which we have the responsibility uh, to do as instructors. Okay. So you can see there's a lot of EDC staff here. They get paid to actually be here, unlike the rest of your work. <laughs> OK, very good. So this is a presentation on, on grading. Uh, but I hope that we can make it a bit more of an interaction. There are things that I would like to cover, because I do want to get some you know, important principles uh, across. On the other hand, uh, I do want this to be, I was just saying to a colleague, when I go to a workshop, I often am motivated because I have a kind of a specific issue or you know, problem that I want to address. And so I'm hoping that that gets covered. So rather than hope, um, you know, please feel free to just raise your hand as the presentation is going. Um, and we can address those issues. I I'm aware that there's a, uh, there's a second uh, piece to this presentation after one o'clock where people can hang around for specific questions, but you may not be able to hang around. So if there's something that's coming up and it's, rela and it's related to something you're thinking about, just please raise the question and we'll take it there. Because you know, unlike assessment more broadly, the grading is more the, you know, the, the details of what you have to do. And it's just filled with you know, all sorts of issues. Um, you know, just off the top, you know, as, an, as an instructor, I had to face them too. So someone has to take a, uh, a uh, second exam because they, you know, they were ill or what do you do? Do you give them the exam you gave everybody? Do you come up with a new exam? Those kinds of details are the kinds of issues that everybody goes through, but we don't actually have a lot of discussion about them. So often we feel like we're trying to make decisions on our own without necessarily understanding what, uh, what is expected. Now, um, I want to say something about documentation. Um, there is documentation on the Carleton website. If you go to the Carleton ho homepage, you put in grading, you'll get documents about what the university thinks grading is all about. And I want to bring that up because I think you need to start there. You need to understand what the expectations of the university are. Um, you'll see interesting things. For example, uh, so some things that might appear to you at first arbitrary, like what constitutes an A? University has a statement on that. Anything between 90 and 100 is an A. And guess what? That's also the grading system of University of Toronto. And so there's more consistency around some of these issues than you might imagine. And you can find some of that in those documents. And all I did, Maristella did, and Maristella and I worked on, all we did was go to, to the Carleton web homepage and say grading. And we got these documents. And it's worthwhile being aware of them as opposed to not being certain. Sometimes you might think about, well, in my department, that's OK. That's fine. In fact, I want you to know, I think it's important to know the grading policies and practices and culture of your department when it comes to grading. But I also, as a faculty member and instructor, I want you to know what the university thinks. Because sometimes what happens is there's a little bit of creative drift <laughs> you know, that goes from the formal documents to the departmental documents. That's fine, but as an instructor or a faculty member, I want you to know what the formal document says about things like retakes, grading ranges, all of those kinds of things that are there. OK. So let's see. I've got my first slide up there. Um, Maristella. Would you mind, uh, they, they may be ready on my desk. Uh, yeah, the, the slides. Yeah, would that be, okay? Yeah, let's, yeah, I think it is. Okay. So the, the first part is I want to uh, start off with what seems like a relatively straightforward comment, and that grading reflects the actual ability of students. So why might that be more challenging 
of a, of a statement than one might imagine. Would you mind handing them out as you, right? Yeah. We don't always test to their abilities. We don't always test to their abilities. They, they don't always do well in tests. Okay, so, all right, so there's, there's that. We may not be capturing what we would like to capture from them, all right? What else might be going on? Just to their ability, anything, any other issues come to mind when you see that statement? Against what standard? Against what standard? Exactly. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is where, you know, the issue of grading to a standard is problematic everywhere. It's most problematic sometimes in universities because often we don't necessarily have a curriculum. If you think of education from K to 12, groups and, and groups of people have worked on the development of a curriculum and that these curriculums have been standardized and accredited. But often we're in a situation where someone says, we'd like you to teach an introductory course to Canadian history and it's up to you what you're going to cover and it's up to you to determine the standards that you were going to hold students to in order to determine whether they get credit or no credit for the course. So for us, there's a little bit of a black hole in terms of you know, understanding what our standards are because we're often the source of the course and the standards themselves. We don't have an external source to help us. Any other issues? Yeah. I think we mentioned in the first session there is the pedagogical grading or evaluation where you uh, evaluate the effort of the students rather than the uh. Yes, now, and, and that's a very important point because this has been a debate since the beginning of time. Uh, should a grade, what should a grade reflect? And this already is making a statement. So, uh, so this statement is really a reflection of someone like me from the world of assessment. This is what assessment think, people think grades should reflect. And that is the ability, of a, the actual ability, as opposed to having a grade reflect kind of a combination of both effort and ability. And we've battled this in education since forever. And uh, you know, some of you know that we, that I like to make reference to the fact that even in kindergarten, there are report cards that differentiate a child's ability from their effort. So a child may be oh, enormous amount of effort, but their ability still may be quite modest, right? What it's really saying is that the student is willing, is demonstrating an ability to engage in the material. But that's a different thing than to say this is the achievement. Most times when someone is looking at the, and because you know, our work just doesn't sit within our world, our assessment decisions, our grading decisions follow the students into the next world presumably the world of work or the world of selection to another program. What do we know? What we know is that when we're looking at grades, whether we're deciding to let somebody into a professional program or we're looking at grades because we want some information about um, their skills as they relate to some job they're applying to, most individuals reasonably assume that the grades that they see on a transcript reflect achievement, right? There's no way to easily accommodate, understand, or control the degree of effort that someone may use to you know, get at that grade. That's where the inconsistencies come, well, additional inconsistencies, right? And so that's, from that perspective, grading is often thought of as something that reflects actual achievement. Is there a place, is there a place to recognize effort? You could capture in participation. And you could also make it, you know, a, a piece of formative assessment where you, in, you are informing the student that you recognize that they've made significant strides in this academic term, right? But that in fact, it does not affect, you know, the reality is they still got a B minus. <laughs> but they made huge gains, right? I want to bring an example. Last year, I had a very good student, a a student who missed the final exam. Uh, right. Because he partied or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then he was extremely. His ability is great. Yeah. And so is his ability to party. Yeah. And uh, then I said, "Well, that's too bad. He's really good, you know." Uh, so uh, I made a makeup exam for him, and he missed the makeup exam. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> All right, okay. At that point, uh, I was contacted by uh, whoever takes care of the grades. Like, mm -hmm. And they said, well, is it an F or is it a C? Is it whatever? We make the average of what he did mm -hmm. succeed. And thinking that he wouldn't want to have an F on his rec transcripts and everything, and because I had not made it a mm -hmm. condition, Mm -hmm. Although I think it's a university condition that you have to go to the final exam, not necessarily. Anyway, he ended up with, I, I calculated his average with an F on the final exam, and so he passed the course with a C plus, mm -hmm. or C, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, okay, now, when people will look at his transcripts, that's really too bad, but that's one of the consequences of life, right? Well, the thing is... And you if you want to get a job and you miss the meeting, well... Not good, right? So maybe it is the ability, the actual ability of the student, right? Well, and yeah, a bit of, an of course, yeah, and, and that's that's a very common situation, right? Um, but we can only make a judgment on the body of evidence that's in front of us, right? If there's no evidence to to make a judgment, how could we? Well, you know, based on what I think this student's potential ability under the best of circumstances. And if it relates to a weeknight as opposed to a weekend event, which we're bringing in the parting part, but you'd have to qualify all that kind of stuff, which is not particularly helpful. You can only make a judgment on what's in front of you, right? And if students don't submit work, I think it would be, of course, I think it goes without saying, it would be misleading to infer some level of achievement when none has, you have no evidence to show it, right? Frustrating, but a reality, right? Okay, good. Good, good, good. The second point I'm going to want to make is that grading is a profoundly personal communication. It's an intimate communication. Intimate in the sense that, you know, it, it touches people in the, in the deepest levels of who they are. People often, students often, characterize themselves and their worth around all sorts of external factors. And grades are one of them, right? And you can see this even in, in very young children who don't receive a top grade or a strong grade, how they internalize that grade as not something that just relates to their reading level, but often something that relates to who they are. And I, my own experience is that this doesn't stop. You know, I have graduate students who, who display this kind of, of behavior, internalizing, you know, the, the comments. It's one of the reasons why they have such a long time finishing. They have to get through the emotional part of the fact that it's a work in progress rather than not a judgment every time someone gives you feedback about who you are as a person, right? My, my supervisor used to say it to me all the time, let me, let me start off by saying, before I return this version of your thesis, let me start off by saying that it's, I'm not criticizing you as a person, but only challenging your ideas. And I would go home and I would read the comments and from what I could see, this was clearly an indictment as me as a person and there was no way around it. <laughs> and so you realize the consequences of this. It's a part of the reality, but, um, but it only comes up in, in as much as that what we actually do say to students is important and that we place it in a context that is, is such that we are m maximizing the possibility that they will see it as constructive as opposed as a condemnation of their work or their thinking, right? Okay. And... Is that all right? Try again? Sure. Okay. Wow. It's great to have someone who knows what they're doing in a room, right? <laughs> okay, so let's start off with the very first grading grading uh, categories that we have on record, Yale 1783, right? So now you're going home with your grades to your family and friends, and you're one of these four groups. This, was, this, this uh, actually predated A, B, C's, and D's, and in fact uh, gave rise uh, to A, B, C's, and D's, which were actually, I believe, initiated at Harvard, uh, in, often in response to some of this kind of stuff, which most people thought as being inhuman. And let's face it, how proud you must be when you can go home and say, well, I was graded as unmentionable, you know. <laughs> All right, so grading has a dark history. 
Um, and in fact, in, all, in many aspects, grading has a This is a very, uh, a very nurturing grading period as composed to the past where uh, we went out of our way to point out the inadequacies of an individual. So you, you remember this notion, it's not about your ideas, it's about who you are. Well, this certainly is about, about who you are, right? <laughs> who knows what the ideas were that they didn't get, but these, you know, inferior, you know chari charity passes is my favorite, right? And because I know many of us actually engage in that very practice, right? <laughs> charity practices, right? <laughs> okay, but the point is that, that this has a, grading has a long history, and it's usually, it's, it's been a history that has not been, you know, blessed by a humanitarian approach towards students. In fact, you know, we don't have to go back to 1783, but in my early work, my first jobs had to do, uh, I worked in institutions, and I'm going to use the phrase that was used at that time, uh, for the mentally retarded. Not individuals with mental handicaps, but mentally retarded individuals, right? And that's where I started my work. And that was a, that was a, a progressive step forward from what the, these individuals were previously called, which were idiots and imbeciles. And these were actual classifications, right? So it's a, when we come to the whole world of grading and we try to actually make some positive headway, we have to appreciate the history of some of this some of this work and the labels that have followed it. So it's very difficult when you talk to students about creating a positive learning environment. You know, this is a history that walks into the classroom and, and so it, it, it's something that we have to work at, at least be aware of. For our purposes, um, and you know, generally grading is, comes of these two forms. Now, let's start off with the one on the bottom. Norm reference, what's another diabolical term for norm reference grading? What is it really talking about? The bell curve, right? And, uh, and even today, even today, the bell curve is still used on university campuses uh, as being inappropriate. So just let me clearly, clearly say that uh, the bell curve uh, by design was used for the most part for, the sele for selection purposes. Right? And to some extent, it is still used for selection purposes. So when you are trying to do something like select individuals for medicine, a, a medical school, you want to make distinctions, and sometimes incredibly small distinctions in ability. You need to rank order these individuals, because you may have 5,000 applications and 500 seats. And so you rank their performance on a bell curve, and you only let in the very top end of the bell curve. Right? So you're ranking everybody against each other. Fine for selection. But it has no place in the context of learning. Right? For learning, we are not interested in how much you've learned relative to the person beside you. We're actually interested in how much you've learned. And that's why in our, when we're talking about grading in courses, we talk about we are grading against a criteria. So we talk about criterion reference grading. When you give a grade, the grade really should be a reflection of how much the student knows or doesn't know of the things that you've declared are important for them to learn. The objectives, the learning outcomes, right, that you've talked about in previous sessions, right? That's really what the decisions we're trying to make. How much of the curriculum have you mastered? That should be your, so it's really you as a student against the criteria, the list of things that the instructor is hoping that you will learn and master. That is the comparison, but not the comparison in terms of how you've done relative to someone else. Yeah? When I just told my first course, and I was told quite clearly, this is a like, third year course, there should be this many things. But it wasn't like however many yeah. things I want to give because I learned them. Yeah. It was like there should be this many things, and you're going to get questioned if yeah. there's too many things. Yeah. What can I tell you? Uh, even now, I can hear the angels in heaven weeping when I hear those kinds of things. <laughs> it's, it has nothing to do. Those, these things are, um, they're incredibly, it's an incredibly powerful concept that there should be some order in the universe and that it should actually happen. Now, you're talking about a third year class, right? Yeah, it was third year. Well, I, I, 
and there was a table that said if it's a first year class, you should have this proportion of yeah. a second year, this, yeah. third, and fourth. Yeah. Like in the well, final, not like by assignment, but the final, final. Well, pe from a pedagogical perspective, there's just, you know, I don't know how one would even begin to try to rationalize, justify that. There just is none. Okay. I was really trying to help these students to do the best they could, right? Like, stop well, why would so you? I, 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 I would know. echo that. If yeah. your grades are, if you're a really good, if you set objectives, you're a really good instructor, and everybody learns, you're going to hear it from the dean. Right. And in this university, you are not allowed. Right. Well, you just, have to apply bell curve. So ju just so that you say, just so that you can clearly say, that, you know, that people in the assessment world, and you can actually name me, they can call me, I think that that's totally inappropriate. Pedagogically, it's totally unsound. Uh, and, 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 and one of the reasons why it's totally unsound is for the very reason you just raised. What is the incentive for you to reach out and help the students who are struggling if you already have predetermined the distribution of your grades? Right. If, yeah, I ended up being quite relieved that some of the A students had handed in their assignments late and got late penalties, which meant they were in the Bs. And that was the only reason that I didn't have too many of them in the A's. Exactly. Exactly. I hope that my F is not rocking the class, so I can keep the F to have the good average, right? <laughs> well, what can I tell you? You 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 made the argument more elo eloquently than I possibly could have made it. That's exactly my fear, and that it actually impacts. On you as an instructor. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Thank God they missed that assignment. Working, your, <laughs> yeah, working in the same institution. It's yeah. very curious, actually. Oh yeah. Well, you know, evil is everywhere. But nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think you know, quite seriously, I, I think you can you can see how important it is because it's not just an issue of fairness to the student, but it robs you as an instructor of something very important, which is your love of teaching and your love of seeing students learn. I mean, some of the, one of the great satisfactions we typically get as teachers is to identify those students who are struggling and help them move forward. But you do run against that kind of thinking, and, and, and I realize that, and you have to work within that framework. But I, I just want you to feel confident that, you know, that your instincts are correct around this. Yes, please. What can we do about that if we're getting grades bounced back and they're saying they're too high and the students are then doing their own evaluations being like they're too tough? and well, I think you can only do what's within your control. And one of the things that you can do that's in your control is to, you know, be clear about how the, these grades occurred, right? So I think the, uh, the, the problem is, I mean, we're not questioning the fact that predetermining grades doesn't seem to be a reasonable thing to do, right? Because it already, has, it already determines the characteristics of the students that you're getting. And how could you possibly do that? Because all of you know that every time, you might be teaching the same course, but the cohorts are different, right? One year, you get a strong cohort. Another year, you get a cohort, you have no trouble you know, filling out the lower grades. But other years, it's impossible because they're keen. And you, so now we're starting to you know, force you know, separation, distances from students for not a justifiable reason, which doesn't make you feel very good. So what you, the only thing that you can do, and you know, I've been called in on the, on the carpet myself as an instructor, is to be very clear about the nature of your students, what you, what you do as an instructor, what they do, what extra efforts are going in to ensure that, you know, that, you know, they are getting the strong grades, that this is truly reflective of their ability. Usually, if you can articulate that, in many cases, people back away. Because one of the things that, that works best in this scenario is that you cannot communicate. That you cannot communicate why you have the grades that you, you have. The moment that you can't clearly communicate, you may make some inroads. And sometimes, you know, people in authority, which by the way, to be sympathetic towards them, there, there's also external pressure on people in authority uh, because, you know, there's this sense that instructors are giving away grades for, for nothing and departments are giving away grades and this faculty is easier than that faculty. And so they also hear those voices. And there may be people who are asking you to do the things that they themselves won't, don't want you to do but feel pressured that they need to respond to them. So you have to listen carefully to why these things are happening. But the best thing that you can do for you, your students, and for the people in authority 
is to have a clear under, ex explanation for why you got the grades that you got. And you might point out that, you know what, this, there is variance. You might say, well, you know, as it happens, last year I didn't have these high grades to this extent because I got a different group. But this group is considerably stronger. And that's why the grades look, look you know, uh, greater. The other thing is, you know, the assignments you have also can play a, a very significant role. Um, interesting, relevant assignments are going to produce interesting, relevant submissions. <laughs> and unfortunately, they are going to look stronger and produce higher grades. The other thing, we'll, we'll talk about other things that can actually contribute to higher performance, but you need to be able to, to clarify. I, I will tell you that from my own experience at the other end. When I first started work, after my, my work in, 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 in institutions, I moved at some point to school psychology. And my job was to, to assess uh, children from K to, uh, K to 8. And inevitably, uh, I had to have the teacher-parent interview in which I reported my results. And you can imagine parents coming in fearful, frustrated, and I'm the person who's reporting the, the, and I rarely had great things to say because nobody would have called me if there was a great situation, right? And what I discovered over time is that the attack was rich as my explanations were impoverished. Because if I, I didn't understand how to communicate it effectively to parents, but as I began to understand my role and the assessment and the tools and everything, even delivering tough news <laughs> came, worked. I didn't have to make them happy. I didn't have to change my scores. I just had to be able to explain to them clearly what I did, why I did it, and what it means. Right? And I think that's the same thing when you are inter interacting with a student who is challenging your grades. Right? You have the same challenge. If you sound like you can't remember, you don't know, well, at the time it seemed like it only fulfills and feeds their expectation and fear that there's a lot of ambiguity going on in your grading. Right? You have to be clear about why you did what you did. Right? But just understand that when you're in a culture which they're already predetermining grade distributions, this is clearly at odds with sound pedagogy. You cannot, you cannot predict the distribution of grades. There's no way you can say you need three this year. And by the way, you need three next year and three next year. That just doesn't work. But we also have to have some understanding. Where is that pressure coming from? Why would anybody say that? This seems like a very intelligent person to me. But why are they telling me to do something that clearly is at odds with any reasonable rationality? It's because there are external forces. And external forces can only be dealt with by clear and well-articulated rationale for why you do what you do. Right? And that's the, and we live with it. Yeah. There is another angle. We, we also get these letters from the dean's office. And uh, then we were made aware of that there is a, um, in the literature, there is a, um, um, what is it? Uh, a, a relation between good student evaluations and high grades. So mm -hmm. in, implying that people, teachers, um, like to give good grades so that they get good student evaluations. You know, there are undoubtedly studies that uh, may reflect that, but there are other studies that do not, right? So there's, there's clearly, it's not a clear issue that if you give good grades, you get good ratings, right? Um, if it was that, if it was that clear, there wouldn't be much to discuss, but there's plenty to discuss around this issue, right? You can always think of an instructor, a colleague who you know gives away grades and good, gets good ratings. And I think it's those exceptions that really get a lot of attention. But for the truth, uh, you know, if you look at the overall body of research, they're actually, the estimates of students are more reliable than we actually think, right? And it has to do with the, the tools that we use to make determinations, the degree to which the students understand what they're being asked to do. Remember, you're putting students in uh, the role of assessor. There isn't a single single situation in the world of assessment where some training in education doesn't happen when you're asking people to play that role. You, it is just a natural consequence. Some of you know that I do licensure examinations. 
a pivotal piece of ex uh, licensure examinations for the health professions, people going into the professions, is that I spend time with the people who are going to make the decisions, who are going to observe the behavior, that they understand their role, and they understand the tools and the items, right? Otherwise, you cannot ask anybody to, to do something fairly and, and use the information in a valid way if students don't understand this. And the, and the thing about course evaluations, it's like a secret. We don't talk about it. But in truth, there has to be some awareness of what we're asking students to do uh, in, in terms of making those judgments. The more informed they are, the better and more reliable. And you don't get these anomalies where just because you, you know, you're funny, you get top grades. You know, I think the most, you know, one of the examples when that started to make me look at uh, other data that seemed to suggest, in fact, even if you get, you know, high grades is not a predictor of, um, of high evaluations, is I had two students outside my bulletin board at, when I was at the University of Calgary, and they were having a discussion, and they were talking about some course in which the, the, courses, the course marks in those days could be posted. And they were talking about this course that they were in, and I, 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 did, I distinctly heard them say, wow, look at all those A's. And one of them said, yeah, I took that course. I got an A. I said, you know, he said, got an A. I didn't learn anything. And that told me something about, all right, now that, I, I doubt very much if that person would have ranked that instructor high, or more likely, may, they may not have filled out the evaluation at all, because that's more likely to occur, right? So we have to be careful that, you know, it's, it's fairly complex in terms of looking at relationships between how people are, are judged and what those, that data actually means, right? Okay, so. How many of you actually teach in faculties where the curriculum is, in fact, predetermined? You have standards. Yeah? How about language? Do you have standards, European standards? Does anything influence, you know, your, your courses in, in the curriculum that you teach? In, yeah. Do you, do you make it all up yourself, or do you? Yeah, right, okay. So you have, right, so you. Right, so you have standards, and those are the things that influence the assessment activities and your teaching, right? So that's the criterion. Those are the standards. That's to what you assess, right? Richard, you also raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, and that's that role that we are often are playing. We're, de we're de determining both the curriculum and the standards all at once. Yeah. We do have, in the modern languages, we do have the standard that mm -hmm. you mentioned, mm -hmm. European French mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think we have the same levels across the languages, but then each instructor has freedom to choose the weighting or, you know, how much does the final exam, right. or do we have a final exam and all that. So every instructor has quite a bit of freedom. Right. Instructor. Yeah, and, and we want to balance that, right? As instructors, we would like a little bit of control in our classroom, as, but when there isn't a thoughtful discussion about how we're assessing as a group. That can create some real differences and real problems in any department, right? Okay, so, so we talked about the two big kinds of assessment, you know, uh, criterion reference, norm reference. But let's talk about formative and summative. Now, universities are really good at summative. That's the formal kinds of assessment, right? Midterm, quizzes, finals. When you're making an overall summative summary judgment, right? The kind of assessment that has the greatest impact on learning is actually formative assessment. And formative assessment is the kind of things that you do day to day in your class, trying to determine whether students are getting it, giving students an opportunity to get it, to get it. Now, an interesting thing is, is, is actually emerging. <laughs> that in an attempt to integrate feedback um, in classes and formative assessment, the kind of daily stuff that you might use just to see where students are, we're starting to feel the need to actually give credit to formative assessment, right? So now, how many of you are, are doing that kind of stuff? All right. So, so some of the interesting perspectives on, on this is that formative assessment is really the playground of learning. 
it's the playground of learning. It's where you get a chance to be assessed, but it doesn't necessarily count, right? The whole purpose of formative assessment is to create an environment that maximizes one of the most critical things in learning, which is the availability of feedback, right? And it also, so, so some, some people who think about formative assessment would say that really what we want to do is create those environments. You know, you can think of some of the uh, examples like online, for example. You, you have uh, formative assessment programs where students can do, you know, say, math problems. And there may be a criteria. And that is, um, in this formative assessment, in which, by the way, you're not going to get graded, which is a little different, right? You're not going to get graded. But here is a grading system that you can work towards on your own. It's your own self-assessment. And it might be something as simple as, you can give yourself an A when you can correctly do 15 questions without getting any help or feedback from the computer. And so students have been known to actually work through these problems, right? And they're striving to hit this criteria. It's kind of self-motivating. They're in total control of their learning environment, which is another great aspect of, uh, of formative assessment. And they work towards getting this A. It doesn't relate to the program, but they seem motivated enough because they're getting feedback you know, in terms of uh, as they're learning. They're trying as many problems as they can. They get feedback. They go back in. And they keep working, working, and working. And then they tell us, OK, I've had enough time in the sandbox. I'm ready to take on the exam. And so they declare to us when they are ready to take the summative assessment. So that's one way of, you know, people say, well, do I always have to give marks for formative assessment? You don't always. I certainly understand why people do. But if we, we can actually create fairly motivating processes, do you notice that, you know, in my description of what was going on for those students who were in that formative world, what are they getting out of that process that is of value to them? Confidence. They're getting confidence, right? What else are they actually getting? Practice. Practice, right. You know, practice gets people to Carnegie Hall, let alone to the final exam, right? And they're getting it in a self, you know, in, in a motivating environment. But students seem quite committed to reaching these goals that actually have nothing to do with scores at all. They just want to hit this goal. I mean, you know, the aspect of learning that online actually can give us feedback, right? I mean, the very word itself is nourishing. This is why it's so critical to learning. You're feeding them. And there has to be sufficient you know, feeding before you go to harvest. <laughs> you know, the plant's got to grow. And it cannot just be presented, assessed, and moving on, right? So we need to create these environments where students can actually play with the content in a motivating way and then move to formal assessment. Right? So why is this even important? It's because this kind of loop of feedback, student engaging, um, number one, engagement itself with the materials is considered a highly important aspect of successful learning. Right? The more we can create students, give students an opportunity to engage in the material, the more they're likely to learn the material and the more valid, valid the final grades when we get to summative. When we get to summative, the more valid the final grades are. Do we play in the sandbox in universities? It's pretty tough, right? You give an assignment, you score it, they get it back. Maybe they get feedback, maybe they don't. So this thing that's supposed to nourish them may be totally absent. You get to the next assignment, they submit it, you score it, they get it back. Hardly any talk occurs about it, and then we and the cycle continues. So Where's the nurturing? Where's the, <laughs> it, it's, it's difficult, but nevertheless, it's part of learning. Yeah. I use a lot of group work in my lectures, so I stop the lecture, and then I give them a problem, and I put them in small groups. Great. And then I call one to do a blackboard, like to present the answer, and then they self-evaluate, like the right. group and tell. Right, so peer teaching. Like one person or right. one group in front of everybody, I guess that's formative assessment. Yes, right? yes. And then they are left to evaluate what they did. 
you know, comparing with the feedback. I right. can ask questions. Wonderful. High degree of engagement, right? Very good. I mean, that, and that is critical to learning, right? How do you create environments? Now, it, now you got to remember that a lot, for a long time, we thought, well, if, if I said engagement, well, they engage, they, of course they're engaged. They're engaged at the exam or the quiz. But unfortunately, those are summative assessment activities. The kind of engagement we want is ongoing, and those are the kinds of things that we have to create in our courses. Now, in language, you're, you're doing formative assessment all the time because <laughs> they're talking, and they have to, right? There's no, there's, there's no way of, I'll, I'll just say nothing until, you know, three weeks from now, we'll do the quiz on, on voc vocabulary or something. Not going to happen, right? They have to engage, right? So these models are, are helpful in terms of teaching other areas in which the principles are the same. Engagement is important. Getting feedback is important for the purposes of what? For the purposes of when you finally get to the final exam, the quizzes, you get the best valid data that you can. You're, you're talking about, you know, students don't show what they necessarily, you know, have achieved or have learned. Okay, so we have to create an environment in which they can actually play with the material so that we, when, they finally, when we finally say, okay, it's time to step up and show us what you know, they've had enough time to play with it, right? Okay. Validity. These are the, the cornerstones of, assess, of, of assessment, determining the validity of our assessment. So we've, we've talked a little bit already, meaningful activities, the issue of relevance. Well, this, is a, this is a powerful notion. You know, it comes, um, some of you are already familiar and probably have heard if you come to other sessions, the notion of backward design where we already, we start not by what content are we going to cover, but what outcomes do we want our, see, our students to achieve, right? And so we start with that. These are the learning outcomes I want my students to demonstrate by the end of this course. You're going to go right down to by the end of this class, right? So once we have those learning outcomes, then the rest of it is driven by that. So if, if these are our learning outcomes, what assessment tools am I going to have to develop to to demonstrate that they've achieved the learning outcomes, and what is the content that's going to feed that whole experience, right? And so coming up with relevant assignments, no matter what you teach, and now I'm talking about calculus, I'm talking about engineering, I'm talking about all subjects. Learners don't, you know, differentiate. The thirst for relevant learning activities is pervasive. And some of you, I know, have some incredible relevant assessment activities. You put a lot of thought into developing them. There's an element of creativity. There's an element of reaching out beyond the classroom that you've created in these assignments. And students quickly identify and see the value of them, right? Remember that, you know, it used to be you could say to students, well, you know why you're going to learn this stuff in year two? is so that you can do this stuff in year three. And that used to be relevance, right? Well, that's not relevance anymore, you know? It should have never been relevance to begin with. Relevance is much more broadly. Here's something that you're learning here that you can transfer to another learning environment. I mean, the whole point of learning is transfer. You're not teaching somebody to learn this for the purposes of only reporting it back on an exam. You're, you're, you're teaching them something that they can carry forth to another environment, many environments. Right? And so that's an important issue of, of relevancy. Representativeness, right? This is all about the content that you teach, right? And, and in terms of grading, there's a very specific purpose here. How you grade should actually, are you ready for this? Be connected to what you taught. I know at first this seems like an in, the insight of the day. <laughs> But I could go across any campus, any campus, and see a disconnect between the materials that are used for the purposes of grading and what actually happened in the classroom or in the readings or in the labs, however you want to define the learning landscape, right? There needs to be a clear connection. I see this all the time. I hear it all the time when I'm sitting outside large gyms. I love sitting outside large gyms as an assessment person. The students are coming out after the exams. And often I can hear this phrase. It comes in various forms, but it ultimately comes down to this. Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> and that is a crisis of content validity. There has been a disconnect 
with what is assessed and what was seen as the landscape of learning. Right? And we have to really work that. And that's why learning outcomes are so important. That's why we start with that problem or challenge. Right? We need to start with learning outcomes to make sure that we get alignment to our assessment activities. Right? And sometimes it's very hard. I appreciate that. You know, for some of you who are teaching very large lecture classes and you're told that you, know, you don't got a TA, and here you are trying to get through whatever 101. You've got an 800 page textbook. And you want to claim that you're teaching students the love of this area, the critical aspects of this area. The reality is you might be limited to only one form of assessment, multiple choice. And it's not that it's evil in and of itself, but you might be limited to using items from an item bank who, have written, who often are written by people who actually don't know anything about the content. Right? It's a selling tool. I, lots, I had lots of books, you know, book agents come in and say, hey, you should, you know, if you take this book for your course, we'll throw in an item bank. You look at the item bank, because these were large lecture classes they were trying to sell. You know, the items were margin, of marginal use, pedagogically weak, uh, not much of a learning experience, because assessment is at the end of the learning. You know, it's supposed to really bring together all the learning that has occurred. Now imagine if the assessment process is totally disconnected to, to, to the richness that you were trying to create in the class. So there are real challenges sometimes in terms of you know, sound assessment practices when you're up against 300 people and you're on your own. And so you, you, know, you, you need to be patient with yourself in that context uh, because it's just very difficult. You get a few TAs, you can start playing with something more interesting. But the truth of the matter is, you know, you need, to, you need to try as best as you can to recognize that alignment needs to happen. And it's not just the mapping of content, right? It's also the richness of the content. You want to assess at the level that you taught the material at, right? And, that, and that's, a, that's often a challenge. If you think, if you spend your class, time in class teaching the critical aspects of a topic, and then you measure it, the whole content at the knowledge factual level, that's also a disconnect, right? Appropriate format, again, all related to alignment. We use the format that is the best fit for what it is that we're going to assess, right? Multiple choice is not necessarily the best fit for critical reasoning. You might want, you want, you might want students to submit a paper or an essay exam, or something that is a better, better aligned with what it is you want from them. Right? So picking the right format for assessment also influ influences the quality of the grading that you get and the results of the grading that you get. Right? The other thing about a format is that it is a teachable, learnable skill. Right? So you always measure two things when you're grading. You measure the content, and you measure the student's ability to work with the format that you've chosen. Right? So if the format is multiple choice, that's going to influence their performance, how well they can do, take multiple choice exams. Because it's a teachable skill. That's why all these companies spend or make billions, not millions, billions of dollars preparing people for exams. Because they know that taking a multiple choice t t exam has a skill component to the format itself, let alone the content. They don't know the content. But what they do know is they can teach you how to use the format effectively. And that issue of format is, is as useful in multiple choice as it is in writing a paper, submitting a lab report. The format is a teachable skill. But often we take it at, make it as an assumption, right? Of course you know how to write a lab. And you might say, well, rightfully so. This is third year. I'm not going over how to write a lab. But then you keep getting in labs that clearly suggest these people don't know how to write a lab. Right? And so that becomes the disconnect again. Right? Challenging, absolutely. That's why models are important. And waiting. How do you determine? Well, you know, the, the, the last two I want to I you know, put together. Grading loves variation. Sound grading loves variation. Now, I just did a talk to a law school. And the dean brought me in because they want to move away from this historical practice in law that, you know, interestingly, nobody could defend. Nobody. And it is this practice of the all or nothing examination, 
right? You take the entire course and the, the evaluation is a single exam at the end of the course. I can't begin to tell you a number of reasons why that is wrong. Number one, ongoing assessment is a tool for quality teaching and quality learning. So if you don't have any assessment throughout the entire term, you've lost all that information that can influence both what you do and what your students do. That, that alone should be enough. So, but this whole note, they're out there, these one-shot exams, totally non-defensible. And uh, sometimes I hear, well, that's what life is. What? That's what life is? You got one shot to do everything. That's it. <laughs> it's not reasonable. You know, we don't wait until we learn in life everything there is to learn, and then we act. Life calls us to act on a daily basis, not at the end of four months. Right? That's not reasonable. Um, and so I want you to think about, if that's not reasonable, where is he going? Well, let me tell you, multiple components of assessment give you better results. So instead of relying on one exam at the end, you rely on a series of assessment activities. You might use papers, you might use projects, you might use oral presentations, you might use lab, you might use responses to readings, whatever it is. It's important to use a bit of, have a variety of assessment approaches in order to tap into the various skill levels. Because I can tell you that your content can't be covered by a single format. When you're teaching, the content will scream out to you, this is how I should be assessed. And it'll probably tell you, oh, maybe it won't, unless you listen really hard. It'll tell you, don't assess me using multiple choice, because that's not going to work. Now, you may be forced to do that, but it's not the natural form of assessment for what it is that you're teaching. What you're teaching will call on you to, just, to use an assessment format that is aligned so that you can get at the things that you want to get at. Right? So you have a couple of things then, right? So you want to have for, for a little bit of variation in your grading by including different types of assessment, paper presentations, submissions, right? And you also uh, want to make sure that you weight them appropriately. And this is really hard, actually. When you, when you first have a course, it's very challenging to determine, OK, now, when people come and see me, I love playing with the weights, because I, I love to ask them, so how did you determine that this assignment should worth 20% and that assignment should be worth 10%? And often people actually don't have a clear understanding. So, but that's okay, because we have a discussion. I know they know. <laughs> it's just that I have to find, ask the right questions until they say, well, th you know, this is why. And it's because they have an intuitive sense of why they're doing this, but it just has to be articulated so that then they understand and have confidence in the fact that they believe it. And if we can't come up with an intuitive sense, then we can revisit the weightings, right? Because, and things like, you know, how much work goes into it, maybe, right? How important it is to the key standards in the course that you, that you really want to cover. There's all sorts of factors that are going to influence the weighting of assignments. But we have to have a rationale for why we weight what we weight, right? And I always say, oh, yeah, please. I was going to say students also <laughs> lots of attention to that yeah. because they're not going to engage in an activity that's extremely time consuming if it's only worth 10%. Right, right. So yes. you've got to think backwards like that. that I, and, and that's, you know, uh, that's the part of grading under the logistics of grading that you can't ignore. You know, I had a faculty member come in and said, you, you know, they're not doing my readings. Nobody's doing the readings. So I said, well, well, how, you, how, does, how do your readings work? Well, I give them three readings each week. And I asked them to submit a, um, a paragraph on each of the readings. And the readings were, like, not insignificant, 10, 20 pages. So how do they get? And, I, and they said, I give, them, I give them one mark each time for submitting three responses. Would you do this? <laughs> and yeah, but the problem is this. See, they assigned 10% to this activity. OK, now, so you can do the math now. That's 30 submissions that a student is going to make for 10%. Now, I'm not going to make, as a student, I'm not going to do that for 1%. The problem is that if I don't do any of it, I have now just lost a letter grade. So what started off as insignificant, one mark for three readings, all of a sudden now turns into the fact that you just blew off an entire letter grade, and now you're starting. 
And we see that's where you know these numbers are important that you you get them right because you can actually have students go down dangerous paths because they may not be thinking it through. And you can say, well, you know, they're you know they're adults. Well, really, and you, I mean, you 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 can't make those assumptions, right? You, you need to kind of create systems that. At least, you know, if you explain it to them. So, by the way, if you've decided that you're not doing any of the readings, just so that we're clear, that's a letter grade that you've decided that you don't want any part of, right? If you have to go to that extent, that puts it in a better, you know, more clear perspective because all they hear is three readings, one mark. Not doing it. Okay? So, we need to talk about the weighting of, of assignments. I think that's very important. And having a rationale. You know what? And it's your rationale. There's, a, there's lots of latitude here for your professional judgment. You know, you, you don't have to worry about whether I got it right. You just need to worry about whether you can articulate it. And then the world will decide whether you got it right. But your first challenge is can you articulate it? Yeah. And then it's linked with the idea of the formative assessment, right? Because sometimes three readings, 10% over the whole course. Mm -hmm. But if that's formative, mm -hmm. right, it's not worth that much because you are practicing. Your yes. Sand, sandbox, yeah. Playing. Yes. Now that's why you have to create feedback systems. So you, so you, and so, the, so remember the key to to not grading formatively is that you still need a grading system, right? You still need a grading system that they can work towards. It's an imaginator. It does. It's not real, but it's still motivating for them to achieve. Okay, I'm going to work until I can do 15 problems without the aid of of the computer without the aid of feedback, right? You still have to create the challenge. That's what keeps them engaged. If there's no challenge, then they're going to go straight for it. No challenge and there's no grades. Ah, not going to do it. Okay. All right. Reliability, I, we, we touched on uh, this a little bit, but clearly um, these are important aspects of grading. Um, do you have a system by which someone's, think about this. If someone challenges your grading of an assignment, one of the things that uh, is part of the, the review is that the department head might give the assignment to another faculty member to grade. But also, what will they hope that they can give to that second reader? Yeah, and how often have I talked to faculty members that have to create a rubric in order so that the review can go forward? They never had a rubric to begin with, right? And so that's an issue, right? That's an absolute issue. You need to have a clear scoring guide. Okay, and um, subjectivity, that's part of what, who we are and what we do, right? It's, there's no reason to run away from subjectivity. It's informed judgment. Capriciousness is what we really worry about. The practice of giving a, letter, a B grade to this paper, and then the next hour, the same quality of paper comes up, and you give it a C. Right? That kind of inconsistency. That's what we worry about. But making subjective decisions is just part of what we do and who we are. And we talked about sufficient opportunities, right? Multiple assignments so that you can get a better picture of the student's ability. Okay, and I'm going to close on this. A bit of a review. We've talked about alignment, and you've heard about it in your other, if you come to the other workshops, aligning your learning outcomes with your assignments, with your grading, right? So what am I going to test? What am I going to grade? What were your learning outcomes? That's the source of testing and finally grading. Clarity of expectation. Number one thing, I go around campus, I do midterm feedback, I listen to what students say, what do they want more than anything? Well, I need more information around the assignments, right? And the instructor says, I told them, I wrote it out, we talked about it. I need more information around the assignments. You can never tell them enough. The other thing too, is it might be, might be good to give them an example of what they, what, when you say good work, <laughs> when you say a work, it might be nice to show them exemplars of what good work looks like. Because often students are unclear what good work looks like. How does that work in terms of, because a student asks me about that. Sure. Like, can I go to students that I have issues with and say, look, I'm really struggling with this or I'm having a hard time with this? Yeah, absolutely. Right. You have permission from them and, and usually most students are thrilled that you're asking. But you do need to ask and it's good to show 
because often we don't know what, a, what good work is. Um, when I had graduate students, first thing I said, you know, someone would come and say, I'm looking for a graduate supervisor. And I would say, OK, just to give you an idea of what I'm looking for, uh, here are a couple of theses that I think were well done by some of my students. I want you to read them. And I want you to come back, and then we can talk. Right? I'm going to show them good work. And if the, it, it resonates with them, there, we have a starting point. Right? But I need to show them good work, because they may not know what it is. Transparency of grading, rubrics, right? scoring guides. You, you, you know, you're going to talk about how you're going to grade. Um, the skill of the students, remember? You're assessing two things, right? You're assessing the content and their skill at actually producing the content, right? And that needs, that's, that's an issue that has to be addressed. You know? This is how I'm going to assess you. Let's talk about that process in addition to whatever it is that you're going to do. The skill of the assessor. You, I have to spend lots of time training people to be assessors, to make those judgments. So there needs to be opportunities, even if you're doing together as peers, to get there. Share. You know, if it's possible to share with your peers what you're assessing and how you're doing it, that would be great. And then providing effective feedback. And effective feedback is feedback that, can, that students understand and that they can use. That they can use. Now, I'm going to, um, I, I appreciate that we did run over. Uh, so I'm going to draw this part of it. Uh, to closure uh, by inviting those of you who can stay a little longer um, to do so. There's a second part to this. For those of you who can't stay, we're going to talk about maybe specific things that are, are, that are challenging you or opportunities that you would like to engage in in the, in the context of grading. Uh, so I'm going to do that now, but for the purposes of those who need to leave, let's take a five minute break and then those who return, we can stay for a little longer and, and if nobody returns, then Thank you, everybody, for coming. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay.